Before anything else, I want to thank Titanium R497 for being my first Patreon subscriber. He got to see this video first before anyone else, and so can you if you sign up. Also, spoiler disclaimer, I'll be talking about a few general events in the game, like directions you can go in, but I'll be avoiding talking about any specific twists and turns with the characters. Okay, let's get into this. Suzerain Kingdom of Ritzia is the new DLC for Suzerain, which was the first and so far only video game I've reviewed. I've worn the works, I swear. But of course I had to come back and talk about Suzerain because even besides the DLC, the game has changed so much. Since I made my video on it, the studio released Suzerain 2.0 as a free update, which added, da 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 da, save files, hooray! and also just added in more events to the story, as well as providing the digital infrastructure for Ritzia and other future DLC. And speaking of the Ritzia DLC, I have to say I found it an excellent addition to the game. You play as King Romus Taurus, newly crowned monarch of the Kingdom of Ritzia, and boy oh boy do you have problems. Your economy is heading towards a brick wall, treaties need to be renegotiated, and you have to deal with your neighbor Pales somehow. Uh, sorry, your neighbor Palais. Thank you, your majesty. Now, I have a few critiques, and I'll get to those later, but overall, I have to say I really enjoyed this expansion. Honestly, though, calling it an expansion kinda sells it short. Kingdom of Ritzia is basically a second full-length campaign in itself, and then some. The gameplay has been expanded upon. See, in the base game, President Anton Rain is constrained into signing or vetoing only laws passed by the Assembly. In the Kingdom of Ritzia, the player as King Romus has access to a whole new system of decrees. There are lots of decrees that can be signed during the playthrough, any time from their initial proposition to the end of the game. It feels like we the player have increased agency to affect the world. There's also a new war mechanic, which I will get more in depth with later, but I do appreciate that Torpor Games is expanding the gameplay. However, I feel that the strongest part of Suzerain, the part that endeared the base game to me most, was its storytelling and the way it built engaging characters. I'm happy to report that the writing has maintained a consistent quality. The story centers around Romus Taurus and the challenges he faces in his first 10 years of his reign, and the ring of characters around him who each have their own ambitions and designs for the country. With this approach, the developers actually fixed one of the issues I did have with the base game. See, I had felt that balancing President Reign's family considerations and political considerations were too separated. They didn't really influence each other in a way that felt impactful. Here, your family is the royal family. As a result, they are far more involved with the political aspects of the story, and trying to balance their personal interests with the good of the country is trickier. It's a brilliant move that I really appreciate. Having done a few playthroughs, I've fallen in love with Romus Taurus and his cast of characters just as much as I have with Anton Rain's group. Some of them subvert common archetypes, others are delightful and fresh incarnations of them. And of course, I shan't say which are which for spoilers sake. And that's not even getting into returning characters, whom we get to see in new situations. Queen Beatrice Livingston, antagonist in the Swordland campaign, is Romus Taurus's family. She gets to show a different side of her personality, which is refreshing. Meanwhile, Victor Smolak takes on a far more prominent role in the story of Ritzia, and he's also a far larger pain in the ass, but again, I will not elaborate for the sake of spoilers. On one level, it is of course fun to go, oh my god, he's talking about Anton Rain! That's the guy from the base game! But more substantively, I really like seeing many of the neighboring leaders in Eastern Mercopa be recontextualized through another point of view. It makes the world feel more alive and fleshed out. All of this is complemented by a new soundtrack from James Spence, which makes for powerful moments throughout the experience. And the storytelling goes even further. See, if you play both stories on the same save file, whatever you decide to do as Anton Rain and Swordland will then have ripple effects and impact the events that occur in Ritzia. That is... amazing! It's an attention to detail that I really admire. It enriches the narrative experience greatly. That's something I want to emphasize. Even as I begin to transition into more critical comments, overall I'm very impressed by the scale and ambition of the Kingdom of Ritzia. It delivers on all the strongest aspects of the Suzerain base game, doubling it in size. It's basically a second game for only $10. In a world where games are increasingly being pushed to be over $100 for the complete experience, a $10 DLC that doubles the size of a $20 game? 
is really, really good. It makes me more excited to see the future of the game's development. Now, getting to my more critical remarks on the game, most of it is stuff that's not anything deep-rooted. A few little spelling errors, a couple bugs, things that are easily patchable. There are a few balancing issues. For example, there's a situation you have to deal with where Ritzia is running low on energy reserves and the economy is too tied to a single resource. I specifically prioritized diversifying those energy resources and succeeded in acquiring them, yet didn't get an updated modifier. That was kind of disappointing, but again, nothing game-breaking. Honestly, in the time it took me to make this video, the developers have already released a number of updates specifically meant to rebalance budget needs and whatnot, so maybe these have already been fixed or will be soon. With the story, the decision to focus on a monarch as the protagonist did resolve one of the most prominent issues with the base game. But it does have its own caveat. President Rain had a natural ending point for his story, the end of his first term in office, with an epilogue showing if he was re-elected or else how he spent his life afterwards. You get that sense of a denouement as your thoughts turn increasingly to re-election. King Ramus' only term limit is set by the Grim Reaper, so where do you finish off the story? Well, there's not really a natural ending point. If you choose to reform the country to democracy, the epilogue kicks off at the first properly elected assembly coming to power. But if you play the game in different ways, it does result in a feeling of, wait, is it over? Was that it? It can feel a bit abrupt. That's not to say I don't overall really enjoy the story still. I just think it's a quirk that's baked into the setting, and honestly, I'm not sure how you'd work around it. Now, Let's talk about the combat system. This is the most striking addition in Kingdom of Ritzia. Even more than a second full-length campaign, this new mechanic really changes the game of... the game. Over the previous turns, you have the ability to construct military units using manpower and supplies you receive. Then if you decide to go to war, and if you opt into the minigame, it is optional, you can then access the battle board. That's not what they called it, but I like that name. After deploying your troops, you can now fight. Now bear with me as I really get into the details here. When two units fight, their respective attack or defense values are compared. If the difference is great enough, the conflict is decisive and the appropriate unit will lose the next turn. However, if they are more evenly matched, the conflict will continue through the next turn even if one side has a slight advantage. You can also order units to support neighbors who are locked into combat, adding a special support modifier. These orders are given through a set number of actions that you can take each turn, and each battle phase you have a limited number of turns to reach your objectives. Whether or not you reach those objectives will impact the way people interact with you and how events unfold in the game. Now, I do like the presentation of this. It kind of reminds me of Risk, or more closely, Civilization V, with the one unit per tile rule. It's still unique enough, of course, to stand on its own. The difference between attack defense values and support modifiers makes for interesting strategies, because you have units that do poorly in direct combat, but make for powerful support behind the front lines. And you can strategically place attacks to intentionally fail and distract large numbers of troops while you make your real offensive pushes somewhere else. There's a spark here, there's something really cool. That being said, I feel like there could be some rebalancing done with the way these war games unfold. There's a disparity between what your opponent gets to do and what you, the player, get to do. If I have a unit commence an attack, you notice that the defending unit now gets every neighbor supporting it automatically. Meanwhile, I have to spend most of my limited action points in order to support my assault. And this now limits how much I can do, which is frustrating because I only have so many turns to get to where I need to go. This could be rationalized perhaps as an inherent defender advantage. That would make sense. Except your opponent also gets the same boost when they counterattack into your territory. Don't get me wrong, Suzerain as a game is supposed to be tricky. I feel like you're supposed to fail your first run or two, as you learn what everyone's agendas are and how to navigate them more effectively but this edges into feeling more unfair than anything else. There's a difference between getting outwitted by a character I wrongly trusted 
and a mechanic that feels too stacked against me. To complicate matters, the controls feel unintuitive in many aspects. There are several times I tried to select a unit and cause it to accidentally fortify or swap with another unit. Not only did this use up an action point, it also meant that unit could no longer be used that turn. There was no way to change those orders before the turn ended. It's frustrating and honestly began to impact how much fun I was having with the game. I think the fact that I can see all my units lined up and I can't use them is what frustrates me more than anything. Again, to bring up Civilization V as a contrast, in that game you got to use all your units every turn. Each unit had a limited number of actions, but every unit still got to move. Of course, this might just be a personal thing. Some folks on the subreddit are going, oh, this part's so easy, so maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just bad at video games. Again, I feel like there is something here. The core of the combat system feels like it could be really fun. I just think it needs some changes to the gameplay, a little more breathing room in some area or another to make it feel better. That said, for all the time I just spent talking about the combat, I should emphasize it's still a minor part of the new expansion. You can avoid the war entirely if you want, and even if you do decide to fight, you can still bypass the combat minigame if you desire. And honestly, like, come on, it's a $10 DLC that gave us Suzerain 2. I'll accept a wonky new gameplay mechanic with that. Overall, I really, really enjoyed the Kingdom of Ritzia DLC. I think it's an excellent expansion of the Suzerain universe and has solidified this game as one of my favorites. I'll certainly play through it several more times, and I'm already anticipating the next installment from Torpor Games.